The lay of Chrysostom, since thou dost in thy cruelty desire, the ruthless rigor of thy tyranny from tongue to tongue, from land to land proclaimed, the very hell will I constrain to lend this stricken breast of mine deep notes of woe to serve my need of fitting utterance. As I strive to body forth the tale of all I suffer, all that thou hast done, forth shall the dread voice roll and bear along shreds from my vitals torn for greater pain. Then listen not to dulcet harmony, but to a discord wrung by mad despair. Out of this bosom's depth of bitterness, to ease my heart and plant a sting in thine. The lion's roar, the fierce wolf's savage howl, the horrid hissing of the scaly snake, the awesome cries of monsters yet unnamed, the crow's ill-boding croak, the hollow man of wi wild winds wrestling with the restless sea, the wrathful bellow of the vanquished bull, the plaintive sobbing of the widowed dove, the envied owl's sad note, the wail of woe that rises from the dreary choir of hell, commingled in one sound, confusing sense, let all these come to aid my soul's complaint, for pain like mine demands new modes of song. No echoes of that discord shall be heard where Father Tagus rolls, or on the banks of olive-bordered Betis, to the rocks, or in deep caverns shall my plaint be told, and by a lifeless tongue in living words, or in dark valleys, or in lonely shores, where neither foot of man nor sunbeam falls, or among the poison-breathing swarms of monsters nourished by the sluggish Nile. For though it be to solitude remote, the hoarse vague echoes of my sorrows sound, thy matchless cruelty, my dismal fate, shall carry them to all the spacious world. Disdain hath power to kill, and patience dies, slain by suspicion. Be it false or true, and deadly is the force of jealousy. Long absence makes of life a dre dreary void. No hope of happiness can give repose to him that ever fears to be forgot, and death, inevitable, waits in hall. But I, by some strange miracle, live on a prey to absence, jealousy, disdain, racked by suspicion as a certainty, forgotten, left to feed my flame alone. And while I suffer thus, there comes no ray of hope to gladden me athwart the gloom, nor do I look for it in my despair, but rather clinging to a cureless woe, all hope do I abjure forevermore. Can there be hope where fear is? Were it well, were it well far, when far more certain are the grounds of fear? Ought I to shut mine eyes to jealousy, if through a thousand heart wounds it appears? Who would not give free access to distrust, seeing disdain unveiled, and a bitter change? All this suspicion turned to certainties, and the fair truth transformed into a lie. O oh, thou fierce tyrant of the realms of love, O oh, jealousy, put chains upon these hands, and bind me with thy strongest cord, disdain. But woe is me. Triumph over all, my sufferings drown the memory of you. And now I die, and since there is no hope of happiness for me in life or death, still my fantasy I'll fondly cling. I'll say that he is wise who loveth well, and that the soul most free is that most bound in thraldom, to the ancient tyrant love. I'll say that she who is mine enemy in that fair body hath as fair a mind, and that her coldness is put my desert, and that my virtue of the pain he sends, love rules his kingdom with a gentle sway. Thus self-deluding and in bondage sore, and wearing out the wretched shred of life to which I am reduced by her disdain, I'll give this soul and body to the winds, all hopeless of a crown of bliss in store. Thou whose injustice hath supplied the cause that makes me quit the weary life I loathe, as by this wounded bosom thou canst see how willingly thy victim I become. Let not my death, if haply worth a tear, cloud the clear heaven that dwells in thy bright eyes. I would not have thee expiate in aught the crime of having made my heart thy prey, but rather let thy laughter gaily ring and prove my death to be thy festival. Fool that I am to bid thee, well I know thy glory gained by my untimely end. And now it is the time from hell's abyss, come thirsting Tantalus, come Sisyphus, heaving the cruel stone, come Titius with vulture, and with the wheel Ixion come, and come the sister of the ceaseless toil, and all into this breast transfer their pains. And if such tribute to despair be due, chant in their deepest tones a doleful dirge over a course unworthy of a shroud. Let the three-headed guardian of the gate and all the monstrous progeny of hell, the doleful concert join, a lover dead, methinks, can have no fifter obsequies. Lay of despair, grieve not when thy art gone. Forth from this sorrowing heart, my misery brings fortune to the cause that gave thee birth. Then banish sadness even in the tomb. The lay of Chrysostom met with the approbation of the listeners, although the reader said it did not seem to him to agree with what he had heard of Marcella's reserve and propriety. For Chrysostom complained in it of jealousy, suspicion, and absence, all of the prejudice 
of the good name and fame of Marcella, to which Ambrosio replied as one who knew well his friend's most secret thoughts. Senor, to remove that doubt, I should tell you that when the unhappy man wrote this lay, he was away from Marcella, from whom he had voluntarily separated himself, to try if absence would act with him as it is wont. And as everything distresses and every fear haunts, the banished lover, so imaginary jealousies and suspicions dreaded as if they were true, tormented Chrysostom. And thus the truth of what report declares the virtue of Marcella remains unshaken, and with her envy itself should not and cannot find any fault save that of being cruel, somewhat haughty, and very scornful. That is true, said Vivaldo, and he was about to read another paper of those he had preserved from the fire. He was stopped by a marvelous vision, for such it seemed, that unexpectedly presented itself to their eyes. For on the summit of the rock where they were digging the grave, there appeared the shepherdess Marcella, so beautiful that her beauty exceeded its reputation. Those who had never till then beheld her gazed upon her in wonder and silence, and those who were accustomed to see her were not less amazed than those who had never seen her before. But the instant Ambrosio saw her, he addressed her with manifest indignation. Art thou come by chance, cruel basilisk of the mountain, to see if thy presence blood will flow from the wounds of this wretched being thy cruelty has robbed of life? Or is it to exult over the cruel work of thy humors that thou art come, or like another pitless negro, to look down from that height upon the ruins of his Rome, in embers or in thy arrogance, to trample on this ill-fated corpse as the ungrateful daughter trampled on her father Tarquin's? Tell us quickly for what thou art come, or what it is thou wouldst have. For, as I know the thoughts of Chrysostom never failed to obey thee in life, I will make all these who call themselves his friends obey thee, though he be dead. I come not, Ambrosio, for any of the purposes thou hast named, replied Marcella, but to defend myself and prove how unreasonable are all those who blame me for their sorrow and for Chrysostom's death, and therefore I ask all of you that are here to give me your attention, for it will not take much time or many words to bring the truth home to persons of sense. Heaven has made me, so you say, beautiful, and so much so that in spite of yourselves my beauty leads you to love me, and for the love you show me, you say, even urge, that I am bound to love you. By that natural understanding which God has given me, I know that everything beautiful attracts love, but I cannot see how by reason of being loved, that which is loved for its beauty is bound to love that which loves it. Besides, it may happen that the lover of that which is beautiful may be ugly, and the ugliness being te detestable, it is very absurd to say, I love thee because thou art beautiful, thou must love me though I be ugly. But supposing the beauty equal on both sides, it does not follow that the inclinations must be therefore alike, for it is not every beauty that excites love, some but pleasing the eye without winning the affection, and if every sort of beauty excited love and won the heart, the will would wander vaguely to and fro, unable to make choice of any. For as there is an infinity of beautiful objects, there must be an infinity of inclinations. And true love, I have heard it said, is indivisible and must be voluntary and not compelled. If this be so, as I believe it to be, why do you desire me to bend my will by force? For no other reason but that you say you love me. Nay, tell me, had heaven made me ugly as it has made me beautiful, could I with justice complain of you for not loving me? Moreover, you must remember that the beauty I possess was no choice of mine, for, be it what it may, heaven of its bounty gave it to me without my asking or choosing it. And as the viper, though it kills with it, does not deserve to be blamed for the poison it carries, as it is a gift of nature, neither do I deserve reproach for being beautiful, for beauty in a modest woman is like fire in the distance, or a sharp sword. The one does not burn, the other does not cut, those who do not come too near. Honor and virtue are the ornaments of the mind, without which the body, though it be so, has no right to pass for beautiful. But if modesty is one of the virtues that specially lend a grace and charm to mind and body, why should she who is loved for her beauty part with it so to gratify one who for his pleasure alone strives with all his might and energy to rob her of it? I was born free, and that I might live in freedom, I choose the solitude of the fields. In the trees of the mountains I find society, the clear waters of the brooks are my mirrors, and to the trees and waters I make known my thoughts and charms. I am a fire afar off, a sword laying aside. Those whom I have inspired with love by letting them see me, I have by words undeceived, and if their longings live on hope, and I had given none to Chrysostom or to any other, it cannot justify, justly be said that the death of his any is my doing. 
for it was rather his own obstinacy that my cruelty that killed him. And if it be made a charge against me that his wishes were honorable, and that therefore I was bound to yield to them, I answer that when, on this very spot where now his grave is made, he declared to me his purity of purpose, I told him that mine was to live in perpetual solitude, and that the earth alone should enjoy the fruits of my retirement and the spoils of my beauty. And if, after his open avowal, he chose to persist against hope that, and steer against the wind, what wonder is it that he should sink in the depths of his infatuation? If I had encouraged him, I should be false. If I had gratified him, I should have acted against my own better resolution and purpose. He was persistent in spite of warning. He despaired without being hated. If you think now, if you had reasonable, be it reasonable that his suffering should be laid to my charge. Let him who has been deceived complain. Let him gi give way to despair who encouraged hopes have proved vain. Let him flatter himself whom I shall entice. Let him boast whom I shall receive, but let not him call me cruel or homicide to whom I make no promise, upon whom I practice no deception, whom I neither entice nor receive. It has not been so far the will of heaven that I should love by fate and to expect me to love by choice is idle. Let this general declaration serve for each of my suitors of his own account, and let it be understood from this time forth that if anyone dies for me, it is not of jealousy or misery he dies. For she who loves no one can give no cause for jealousy to any, and candor is not to be confounded with scorn. Let him who calls me wild beast and basculus leave me alone as something noxious and evil. Let him who calls me ungrateful withhold his service. Who calls me wayward, seek not my acquaintance. Who calls me cruel, pursue me not. For this wild beast, this basculus, this ungrateful, cruel, wayward being has no kind of desire to seek, serve, know, or follow them. If Chrysostom's impatience and violent passion killed him, why should my modest behavior and circumspection be blamed? If I preserved my purity in the society of the trees, why should he who would have me preserve it among men seek to rob me of it? I have, as you know, wealth of my own, and I covet not that of others. My taste is for freedom, and I have no relish for constraint. I neither love nor hate anyone. I do not deceive this one or that other, or trifle with one or play with another. The modest converse of the shepherd girls of these hamlets and the care of my goats are my recreations. My desires are bounded by these mountains, and if they were ever, and if they ever wander hence, it is to contemplate the beauty of the heavens, steps by which the soul travels to its primeval abode. With these words, and not waiting to hear a reply, she turned and passed into the thickest part of the wood that was hard by, leaving all who were there lost in admiration as much of her good senses as of her beauty. Some of those wounded by the irresistible shafts launched by her bright eyes made as though they would follow her, heedless of the frank declaration that they had heard, seeing which and deeming this fitting occasion for the exercise of his chivalry in aid of distressed damsels, Don Quixote, laying his hand on the hilt of his sword, exclaimed in a loud and distinct voice, Let no one, whatever his rank or condition, dare to follow the beautiful Marcella under pain of incurring my fierce indignation. She has shown by clear and satisfactory arguments that little or no fault is to be found with her for the death of Chrysostom, and although how far she is from yielding to and also how far she is from yielding to the wishes of any of her lovers, for which reason, instead of being followed and persecuted, she should in justice be honored and esteemed by all the good people of the world, for she knows that she is only the only woman in it that holds to such a virtuous resolution. Whether it was because of the threats of Don Quixote or because Ambrosio told them to fulfill their duty to their good friend, none of the shepherds moved or stirred from the spot until, having finished the grave and buried burned Chrysostom's papers, they laid his body in it, not without many tears from those who stood by. They closed the grave with a heavy stone until a slab was ready with which Ambrosio said he meant to have prepared with an epitaph which was to this effect. Beneath the stone, before your eyes, the body of a lover lies. In life he was a shepherd swain, in death a victim to disdain. Ungrateful, cruel, coy, and fair was she that drove him to despair, and love hath made her his ally for spreading wide his tyranny. They then strewed upon the grave a profusion of flowers and branches, and all expressing their condolence with his friend Ambrosio, took their leave. Vivaldo and his companion did the same, and Don Quixote bade farewell to his hosts and to the travelers, who pressed him to come with them to Seville, and being such a 
convenient place for finding adventures, for they presented themselves in every street and round every corner of Ofter than anywhere else. Don Quixote thanked them for their advice and for the disposition they showed to do him a favor, and said that for the present he would not and and must not go to Seville until he had cleared all these mountains of the highwaymen and robbers of whom report said they were full. Seeing his good intention, the travelers were unwilling to press him further, and once more bidding him farewell, they left him and pursued their journey, in the course of which they did not fail to discuss the story of Marcella and Chrysostom, as well as the madness of Don Quixote. He, on his part, resolved to go in quest of the shepherdess Marcella and make offer to her of all the service he could render her, but things did not fall out with him as he expected according to what is related in the course of this veracious history, of which the second part ends here.